So welcome to the Tech Caddy podcast. That goes out to Kevin Fitzgerald. And Kevin is in the public affairs team in the Southern California Golf Association. And because of uh, Kevin's role there, he serves as the chair of the advisory board for the Los Angeles City Golf Courses. I think, Kevin, you can probably explain it better than me, but essentially that advisory board has a, a seat that's always going to be filled by someone from the California, uh, Southern California Golf Association. But Kevin, why don't you explain exactly, you know, what your title is and your role, and we'll we'll kind of get into the topic of the day. Absolutely. Thank you so much for having me on. And I am the Assistant Director of Public Affairs for the Southern California Golf Association. Essentially, the Public Affairs Department works at the intersection of golf and public policy, and, and that is... Uh, there are a lot of intersections, so um, this this is one component of it, and I know we'll be talking quite a bit about reservation systems and online brokers and so forth. And um, you know, you 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 mentioned the LA City Golf Advisory Committee. Essentially, it is an, an advisory board. It's a subsidiary body. Um, the policy making body is the Recreation and Park Board of Commissioners, and what th that's within the executive branch of government in the city of Los Angeles. So the, the golf advisory committee is an opportunity for the community to um, uh, vet ideas and make recommendations, really part of the public stakeholder input process. So we work very closely with the golf division, which is within the Department of Recreation and Parks. And um, you know, what we'll talk, I'm sure, much more about is uh, uh, the, the way the process works and and uh, this big issue that's that has been getting a lot of attention in the last couple of weeks. No, that, yeah, that's great. And, and, you know, listen, there's a lot of municipalities, I think, that don't even have a board like this. So on some level, it's it's actually great that the that Los Angeles, uh, you know, has John Q. Public essentially is able to participate and and have a voice. You had shared with me previously, um, you know, you certainly, you guys certainly do not set policy, but it's nice. They let you weigh in on things. If an RFP is going to go out, you all might have a say in some things that are included in the RFP before it goes out, right? Or I know yesterday we talked about um, the strategic plan that, that Global Golf Advisors had had built for the city of Los Angeles. And, and you all had access to that. And I know everybody has access to it, but I think you maybe had a little bit deeper role um, in, in pulling that together. And like you said, today we're here to talk about a lot of these reservation issues. But I think one thing that's really important to say, really in defense of your technology provider, who is, uh, I shouldn't say your technology provider, the technology provider for the city of, of Los Angeles, in defense of uh, NBC Sports Next or Golf Now or however you refer to them, th this problem is not new. I mean, there is not there are not enough holes of golf for the number of golfers that there are in Los Angeles. So it's always been very difficult to get a tee time. Maybe you could chime in on this, but I really I say that in defense of Golf Now because this is not uh, uh, a problem, at least in my opinion, that they've created. A absolutely. I mean, I think to take a step back from this entire issue. Um, LA is considered to be the worst place in the United States to be a golfer. There are more golfers chasing fewer holes here than anywhere else. And um, it, it's by a, a fairly wide margin. So, and then to, to paint a little picture of, of what golf in Los Angeles looks like, um, within the city, it's a, over 4 million residents. And essentially you have a few, you know, very high-end private clubs and you have municipal golf. And, and so, the, there are uh, the the daily fee golf course market has has uh, all but disappeared. There's one privately owned public golf course in the city of Los Angeles, and it just so happens that it's in a floodplain, a wash. You can't can't develop the land. So the game of golf is relying upon parks departments waking up and wanting to continue to provide golf as part of its menu of recreational offerings. We, if we want the game to exist where, and be available where the populations live, then 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 we need to do everything we can to support these park systems because uh, they they are golf in, in in a place like Los Angeles. Right, right, and so 
uh, for people that don't know, although I think a lot of people in golf do know, for people that don't know, essentially what has happened is uh, a gray market. And I use that word because I've spoken with other people in the industry that say it's really not a black market, Mike, because it's not there's nothing illegal happening. You could call it a gray market, but a reseller market has essentially been exposed by an Instagram influencer, someone that plays a lot of golf in, in uh, the LA area. And it, it essentially, it's been confirmed, right, Kevin, that yes, there, there are entities that are buying tee times and then reselling them at a large markup, sometimes as much as 40 or $50 per head. Uh, and, and that has essentially validated a lot of public golfers opinions from over the years of why it's so hard to get a tee time. They, there's now a lot of people saying, I told you there is something nefarious going on here. And maybe you can expand on that. Sure. I'll, I'll clarify one point. So um, I, I like your term, the, the gray market, secondary market. Again, I mean, it, it's, it's fascinating that we're in this situation where a secondary market exists. And I think it's important to point out why that is possible the municipal system we're discussing the la city golf system the the greens fees are set well below market and, and that's intentional it the, the the mission of the parks department is to provide an affordable and accessible recreational opportunity and and so for the golf system to provide affordable and accessible golf so you know obviously if you had the, if, if greens fees were at market rates, then um, you know th th there wouldn't be a, a, a great business opportunity in a, in a secondary, you know, gray market. Um, let, one other can I just let me let me just jump in just to make this clear for the listener. When we say they're not at market rates, that is another way of saying they are priced much lower than than it is believed the market would pay for the tea time. That's really what we're saying, right? Is Unlike a lot of other places in America, these tee times are priced significantly lower one, than what the market would be willing to bear. So, absolutely, yeah, thank you. And and I, and I'll say that you know I think that's the mission of the Parks Department, but it's also political security for these golf courses because um, you know we we we've discussed this. There we we're involved with numerous save campaigns throughout Southern California. And, uh, you know, golfers need to show up and make their voices heard and make sure that um, that policymakers know that the community cares about the golf facilities that that they have in their community. And th th these save campaigns are tend to be at golf courses uh, where you can't get a tee time. It's too busy. So, you know, to the non golfing world and to, you know, policymakers who, who may or may, might not be, um, uh, you know, look look negatively on golf, but certainly have other interests for the space, you know, we, the, the, this is a very difficult moment for golf in Southern California, particularly places like Los Angeles. Um, not not long ago, and, and we've been involved with this Sepulveda Basin Vision Plan, three of the LA City golf courses are in this, uh, this, this basin, Sepulveda Basin. It's a floodplain behind a dam. And, um, you know, we basically the the uh, opportunity to weigh in was distributed to the community, and it, it started with: should we get rid of nine, eighteen, or twenty-seven holes? There are fifty-four of the city's holes in this basin. Well, that was about a year ago, and you couldn't get a tee time at these golf courses then. And um, so it really shows. I, I think it's an example of an opportunity here. So while many of the stories are somewhat negative, that if you go down the road of what has become arguably a de facto greens fee increase, because if you need to go to a, a concierge service in order to get a tea time and pay a premium for that, which is well above the, the, the set greens fees, you know, per the, per access to the golf course and under the parks department, um, you know, the, the, the positive of all of this is that there's a, it's, it's obvious that we have too few holes, not, not too many. So right. I think that that's, that's one unique opportunity of this it, moment is to showcase the fact that we actually, um, that the golf courses are not underutilized. To, to go back to the, your, your point about the gray or secondary market, um, right now, and you brought up the legality, you, you, one does not have to uh, 
by the tea time through the parks department. So when you when you reserve a tea time, you don't uh, you haven't paid anything toward it. So I think to your point about the legality, if you were in fact, if had you purchased say a concert ticket and then you resell it in California, um, you, you're not able to resell that ticket without consent to the venue, say the artist, so on and so forth. But what 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 is unique here is that you you, you don't have any skin in the game yet. You, you've just reserved a tea time, and then what you described, um, what really changed in the last couple of weeks was that there seemed to be what I would say was the first you know, real evidence that this broker or secondary market existed. We, we've heard things like the following. Well, I know someone who called this number and got this tea time. They paid this, I think it's a broker. And, and I would say, well, give me the number. Like, I'd love, I'd love to see this. I, I, I want to know more about this. Um, I've never, we never got past the point of hearsay. <laughs> and so a couple of weeks ago, um, there was uh, a post, as you suggested, that and 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 it was clear on everyone's screen that there were it appeared that there were some tea times available um, if you paid this essentially this uh, third party broker a, a, a service charge. And so, um, you know, w w w there are a lot of reasons why this is problematic. But first and foremost, you, you know, the, the Parks Department. Um, uh, does not permit that within their code of conduct. So while it, it may not be so can uh, you, illegal, can you just... it, it's certainly against the code of conduct and they reserve the right to cancel your access, your player card access, if you're if you're taking a tea time, reserving it, and then and then selling it um, as a broker. Okay. okay. The, so the code of conduct, is that something that we can find online? Do you know? A absolutely. Sure. Okay. So we'll we'll try to post that in the in the show notes, uh, the code of conduct, so people. Get, so so that's interesting. You're saying if they really wanted to, um, stick to the you know letter of the law, so to speak, they could prohibit these people from playing. And I guess you had said to me in a previous conversation they have suspended lots of different golfer cards. Uh, res Explain the golfer card a little bit. That's the other thing that I think that's a little confusing uh, out of out of LA. Sure. So in, in the LA city system, the tea times technically open nine days in advance at 6 a.m. if you have a player card. So the player card is $25. It's good for a year. And that what that allows is for uh, someone to get access two days in advance of the the general time that the tea times would become available. So okay, so really, so people for twenty five dollars a year, you can get uh, premium access. Is essentially what you're what, what what that is. Exactly. Now, you know what what some of the frustration has become that you you, you can't get a. It's very difficult to get a tea time that you're looking for, regardless. But it's it really doesn't matter if you in the in the in the sense that. Um, you, if you have a player card, the the incredible amount of demand for each tee time, uh, it, it's it's really something to watch. If you if you log in at five fifty nine a.m. nine days in advance, and at six o'clock you try to book a tee time, you'll see that every golf course is filled in a matter of seconds. Yeah. Well, so let me ask you this, I just because I, I know <laughs> you're going to come back on in another week because you guys have some meetings coming up and it, and I thought it would be really uh, excellent to have you back on and maybe you could update us on what's happening. But, but let me just throw this out there. Do you think there would be an appetite for 14 days in advance for an annual fee of $500? So pay a one-time fee of $500 and I'll give you 14 days in advance access. Is that something that you all would ever consider? Um, you know, I, I think where we're on a bit of a collision course with these municipal systems is that political security component. So, you know, the, there's good reason for these facilities to be concerned about the greens fees um, getting anywhere near market. Um, they, that affordable and accessible model is what allows the policymakers to, you know, feel comfortable with the the use of space for golf um, right if if we were just... to go to a, a point where uh, we see it become 
uh, increasingly expensive to access the facilities, you know, it's, at some point, I, and I don't know exactly where that tipping point is, but if too few can afford to access the park space, then I think the the space will be used right. for uh, another uh, purpose. Understood. Let me just play devil's advocate uh, for sure. a second. So for ten dollars a week, that five hundred bucks a year for ten dollars a week. Um, you could get added access. And, and because that revenue really doesn't have any expense that comes with it or anything like that, in theory, uh, the city could set it up that that revenue goes to support schools. And so now all of a sudden, a group of 11% of our residents that play golf, a portion of them actually are supporting something that even more of our residents care about. That starts to maybe feel like a political win. Um, but but again, I, I'm just some bald guy that lives in Columbus, Ohio. So what do I know about Los Angeles? You know, it's a, it's an excellent point. There are a lot of different models. I, you know, I think the fear within the department, I don't want to speak for the department, but I mean, sure. I think there's always a fear that with each, say, five to ten dollars that the greens fee increases, you just price some percentage of the population out. So and at some point, I think um, while there's there's a great story to be told that 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 there there is revenue from the golf uh, amenity. And some of those dollars are, first and foremost, the greens fee recovers the cost of providing the service plus capital reinvestment. Now, at, at many times they, in, in many systems, they, they do generate some, some, some net profit beyond that cost recovery model, but that allows for more investment into the infrastructure. Some of it gets pooled somewhat into, um, you know the the park's budget and so you know the the money has to be used to provide amenities the, the parks departments offer and but but primarily those fees are 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 for the golf component um each system is different but um essentially i i think you you have a, an interesting idea it's certainly a model that could work well it just becomes a a, a question of balance and ensuring that you know we we would like anyone who has interest in playing that, that they have the opportunity to participate. Well, let's, and, you know, let's talk about that for a second. So you, I mean, you're a, you are a college golfer. You're an accomplished golfer. You uh, uh, seemingly, you, you still love to play. And I'm guessing because you actually are on this LA advisory board, you really do live in or very close to Los Angeles. Is that, would that be fair to say? Yes. Yeah, so ab absolutely. So our, our office in, is in Studio City. That's in the city of Los Angeles. We're very close to Griffith Park, and, okay. which, you know, many, many listeners might might know if they've ever visited Los Angeles. Sure. It's, it's, it's home to uh, the Griffith Park Golf Complex, which has 36 holes, the Roosevelt nine, uh, nine hole golf course right across from the Greek Theater and um, and and then a junior academy and a three par golf course. So it's a it's a large park and we're uh, our office is is very close to all of those facilities well so kevin where do where do you play like how you know give the give the listener a feel how hard is it to get a tee time where do you play how often are you even able to play if it if the if the inventory is so scarce yeah well it, 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 it's extremely difficult when you're someone like me looking for you know a saturday um right. I, I don't mind playing late in the day um, so I, I, I play when and wherever I can. Um, and I, I do like to still play in a few tournaments here and there. So I would say, you know, half my rounds probably end up being in a city championship or something. Um, but I, you know, that, and, and so, but yeah, it, it's, it's very difficult. Um, you, you, you can certainly get out as a single, it's very hard to reserve a, a foursome. Um, and, and then I will say that, uh, if you ask a golfer here, you know, they, golfers also look for that cancellation window. So when you get close to the 24 hours, there are tee times that, that might pop up 25, 26 hours on occasion. It, you, you can't be particularly choosy about which golf course, but um, you know, that there's some way to, um, to get out from time to time, especially if you don't, if you're not looking for a foursome. So I, I don't want to say it's impossible. Mean, it, it would be strange to say it's so busy. You can't play anymore. I mean, that doesn't make any sense. Yeah, that's what Yogi Bear. Yogi Bear used to say, "Nobody goes to that restaurant anymore. It's too busy." So, exactly. exactly. I mean, but um, yeah, and I and I think uh, you know, you you bring up again. It's an interesting concept, it's an interesting model, and I think that you'll see with throughout Southern California that these systems are operated with 
with different priorities. Um, in, in general, they're, they're focused on accessibility, but um, there are various models uh, in, in use and, and, and some of the municipal systems are, you know, city of LA, it's, uh, it's uh, managed and, uh, and all the maintenance uh, is, is performed by um, city employees. And then in other systems, you have um, golf management companies, either yeah, with lease agreements or management agreements. Let's so talk about various that a models, bit. but they're all in generally in, in, in sync with the idea that, you know, that uh, the policymakers would like to ensure that their constituents have access to these these park sure. spaces. So so there is there's L.A. County. Is that correct? There's L.A. County and then there's L.A. City. And, th and those really are two separate entities. Completely separate. Completely and I separate. and I think but I, I listen, I could be wrong. I think L.A. County is managed by American Golf, if I'm correct. Does that sound right? Um, so they, they have uh, quite a few of the golf courses that they manage, but not the entire system. There, oh, okay. there are a number of different um, management companies uh, system. system -wide. Okay. Do, well, th what I'm getting at, and let me just ask you too, you mentioned that there's one privately owned public course in LA. Is that Angeles National or what is Correct. that? Well, it is Angeles National. Okay. Um, used to be a customer of mine. That's why I, that's why I okay. know. So, so okay. So I, what I'm interested in though is, L.A. City runs their own golf courses. I think that's great. And then you've got some management companies, but there probably are different technology platforms being used. I mean, do you feel like or do the golfers in general in the area feel like, oh, well, that course uses that tech platform and it just works better or something or it just makes it it's, it's a better golfer experience? Or is that not on the board at all? What, what's the what's the general notion there? Well, and it, it, you know, it, it, we, we've seen a number of LA Times articles. This this story about the the gray market or or a secondary market, as you suggest, and you know, it, it's it's certainly been a a story that has proliferated around the country. It's just a, an interesting golf story, I suppose. But um, you know, I don't know that the golfer knows. <laughs> You know, the average golfer knows which golf course that they happen to be playing. Um, I, I think that they, they know they're playing golf. And, um, you know, by and large, I think the more avid golfers certainly understand it. But the average golfer who who shows up at and, and just wants to play golf, I, I'm not sure that uh, they're going to be particularly familiar with which system that they're they're hap they, they happen to be playing that day. Understood. Understood. Okay. Now, one of the takeaways, uh, again, and I think this is good for, frankly, to memorialize and to be able to always refer back to, th there is no doubt in the last 14 days, the case has been made, and it didn't have to be made by you guys. It didn't have to be made by Southern California Golf Association. The case has been made that there is a lot of demand for golf. It really would, it would not make a lot of sense to do away with golf or to start to re you know, turn 18 hole golf courses into nine hole golf courses. Based on what's happened last 14 days, that, that would be, that'd be quite a stretch that that makes sense, if you will. Yes, I, I hope so. We're, we're certainly interested in, in, in sharing that piece of the story. I mean, I think if you read, say, some of the, the stories that have been published, I think that component of incredible demand to supply is, is sort of lost in the story of, of broker activity. Um, my greatest fear with all of this is that, um, you know, I don't think that there's a silver bullet from what I know at the moment, and I'm not, um, I don't pretend to be an expert in technology. So as you suggested, Golf Advisory Committee, I, I work for the Southern California Golf Association. I happen to be on the Golf Advisory Committee as one of 18 members. I'm, I'm currently the chair. I can't speak for the committee on what, what recommendations it might take but based on the discussion that we had last week i can say that some really interesting ideas were discussed um, i think some of those um, changes that will you know ultimately come from this interest and in, in trying to mitigate the problem i think some are probably policy solutions and some are probably technological although again i'm not sure that i can speak you know to get too into the weeds on that at this moment. I think a couple is of the when, ideas that were discussed. Sorry. When you, when you say policy, is that another word for pricing that, that, that I mean, really, because we had another guest on earlier and we're going to put different voices together for this particular episode. We had another guest on earlier that said, 
essentially like, yes, it seems like there, you could get a win with some technology or you could make some level of improvement. But at the end of the day, some of this is just going to come down to pricing. Either you're going to raise the fees and lower the ability for a gray market to exist or you're not. And, and when I say you, I don't mean you, Kevin. I, I just I mean the, the city overall. So po is policy somewhat of a synonym for pricing? Um, it, it could be. I, I think I'll use one example of policy that was discussed, which was having, you know, some skin in the game. So as we said earlier, you, you don't, you, right now you reserve a time and you have until 24 hours in advance to cancel that time. You know, one policy change would be a non-refundable deposit. That, that is a policy change that I think is quite likely um, because it, ultimately there might be some way to cut into the 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 market for the brokers now some facilities are highly sought after you know w fraction of the market rate so there i'm not sure that that would work necessarily at every golf course i again i i don't know at this point we're going through the process we're we're, we're going to hear um in in the coming uh days we're, we're going to hear more from staff and uh they're essentially what will happen is there will be another golf advisory committee meeting next week and and staff is going to provide some um, um, uh, recommendations and, and plan to have that public input process take place. Well, the GAC, the Golf Advisory Committee may well endorse what they see in the staff report. They may add additional ideas or ask a lot of questions. Ultimately, the staff will take the report to the board and that is the policy making body. Now, when they when staff goes before the board, it's helpful to them if they can suggest that we've met with the golf community. We've we've had the golf advisory committee review all of this and ask questions. And and, you know, ultimately, they would, I'm sure, like to see the golf advisory committee endorse whatever it is that they propose so that when they go to the board, they can answer those questions that they're not doing this in a vacuum. They've brought the community in and that, that that's really how these. Um, these uh, golf advisory committees, and, and there are, are many different systems, all, all have them here in Southern California. It's a great opportunity to provide that input before that, uh, before the policy making body yes, in Los I, Angeles uh, I, I really agree. make a change. I, I agree. You know, I, I don't believe an advisory committee exists like that in Columbus, where I live. There's a pretty successful municipal group of courses in Columbus um amazing locations is what they and, have you know and i'll <laughs> say that uh, you know it, it, it quite often reviews uh reports from the department but it, it also has the ability to um bring ideas forward vet those ideas and make recommendations and there have been some really good examples of that i i've been on for several years and the capital improvement program in the city of los angeles that 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 went through a dramatic change, a, a shift in how much is 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 now being reinvested in back into the system. So there are ways by which um, the, the collaboration, I think, it, it leads to some very positive results to set the facilities up in the longer run. Well, that's good. That's good. And and listen, I think if you do ultimately move to that model of a skin in the game deposit, that kind of thing, my understanding is the the current technology provider. LA City can handle that today. So that would be great, right? You wouldn't have to go out and shop for another provider. So that would be a win. Um, and and hopefully uh, it becomes a little easier for people to get a tea time. You know, it, it is interesting. It, I wonder if the gray market altogether went away. Let's just say we could wave a magic wand. I don't know what life looks like at 6.01 a.m., for something tr for someone trying to book a tea time, it, it actually might not change it much at all, uh, because if the, if the demand is there, the demand is there, and it, it would it would be very interesting to, to to see in three weeks or in four weeks what that experience has changed to. I agree. I think it's going to be very difficult to win back the confidence of the golf community. The the, the confidence has been lost or at least shaken at the moment, and the the reality is they have fifty plus thousand requests for tea times. And you, a couple other things that changed coming out of the pandemic, not only had we seen golf um, 
participation increasing for several years prior to the pandemic, but then we know participation um, only increased in 2020 and 2021, and they're at, these systems here are at record rounds and record participation now. It, we've sustained and, and captured that interest. A couple other reasons for that, I think. One, the the LA City system is using foursomes and 10-minute tee intervals, so the, the golfer experience has really improved. You, you, you don't have five and a half hour rounds anymore. You can tee off at 2.30 in the afternoon if you're lucky enough to be on the box at that time. You can play in four and a half hours. It's, yeah. it's a really different let's, experience. And so I think let, that- Let's back that up for a second. Absolutely part of why we've retained uh, a lot of this interest. Let's back up for a second. Clue everybody in listening on what it was before that group went to foursomes in 10 minutes. Tell everybody where it was a few years ago. Yeah, it varies, but um, y y there, five sums were permitted in, in most of our municipal systems. Um, we, we generally saw two groups every 15 minutes, somewhere in that that range. Um, it, it, it varied a bit, but... Uh, and it was, did the spacing, the reduction in player, f five to four, and then moving from uh, seven eights, that's what we call it in golf. They yeah. were on seven okay. eights and they moved to tens. Was that all COVID driven? They just wanted less people near each other? Is that what the what the thought was? It was an experiment that I think we were always interested in in running, but I think there was always some fear that you're reducing capacity, that's going to cut into overall revenue and and the overall number of rounds. Now, we're we're seeing record participation, record rounds. I think what has changed is that you're seeing high demand for a 430 p.m. start time this Saturday. That never happened before. And, mm -hmm. and, and also you're able to push that twilight time, uh, starting time back a little bit because you, you're able to fill every tee time. Um, turns out that golfers, there are a lot of golfers who like to play at 10, 11, 12 o'clock, but uh, they, they wanted to play early because they wanted the round to be less than five hours. And so um, because of this enhanced experience, as I like to call it, you know, we're actually enjoying that utilization throughout the entire day. Got it. Got it. So so at the end of the day, even though they did pull back on capacity, if you move from fives to fours, you are pulling back on capacity. Um, you're saying revenue is up. Correct. Is right? okay. It's a, it's a record. And, okay. and I think, um, you know, I, I, I think when you when you look at it, um, overall, <laughs> golfers are not interested in reducing that T interval, and, and they, they don't want to see, by and large, going back to fivesomes. Now, it does make it more difficult to secure a tee time from, you know, seven to one, the, 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 the six hours that most are interested in, the, the most highly sought after uh, hours of, of the week, seven to six, seven to one on Saturdays and Sundays. So there are less golfers that can tee off in that window. However, the experience is, is so much uh, different in, in that sense that if you tee off at 4.30, you get to the box on time. You, you know, it's, it's difficult to stay on pace when the tee interval is, is, is narrow. And so you're going to tee off at 4.30 if your tee time is 4.30, and you're not going to play a three-hour nine. So... Um, you know, overall, it, 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 it's, it was an experiment that I think no one really wanted to run, but now everyone is stuck with it because golfers are happy, rounds are up, the revenue is, um, it, it is, uh, you know, through the roof, exactly really, yeah. where you yeah. would expect based on record means. Yeah, and, that, and that's great. I mean, that really does speak to experience and drive revenue. Right. That, that if you really do provide a phenomenal experience, it can drive revenue. Now, I'll also say we, we hadn't talked about this before. The next guest we're going to have on, his name is Matt Holder, and he runs a, 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 one of these waitlist companies called Loop Golf. What's interesting, though, is all of these waitlist guys, uh, Notify, uh, Tea Time Snipe, uh, Loop Golf, they've all come out of California because they all were experiencing – this tremendous friction in getting a tea time and so so many different people had this idea of well i'll i'll fix that problem i'll build some technology to fix that problem so if nothing else uh this has created a whole bunch of innovation now that has led to like the, the most recent article we wrote was about scraping tea time booking engines and and that's a little you know if you if let's say you're the, the individual that owns angeles national 
So a privately owned public golf course. You can see where that person might be a little turned off to bots coming in and just scraping his tea time booking engine. You know, he's sitting there saying, look, I'm trying to run an honest business. Why are these people doing this? The guys on the other side, and people will hear this on this podcast, the guys on the other side of that coin say, well, the courts say that that's publicly available information and we're allowed to scrape that information and try to uh, help more golfers find tea time. So that's a whole nother subject uh, to talk about. And, and I think as you all work with your technology provider, that's the next question to start asking the tech provider. Can you prevent people from scraping our booking engines? You know, can you put some fraud protection in there or something that can prevent some of this? And I think that's a question for further down the road, frankly. Yeah, and no, that's another topic. Now, you know, we, we, we've seen um, a lot of interest in the last few years considering the um, uh, protection against bot activity. We, we've had discussions about brokers, but really the discussions in the past were, were more specifically about, you know, macros and, and bots having quick access. Um, you know, one, one thing that it, we were talking about what, what a policy change might look like. And one other uh, uh, discussion point was the idea of releasing a tea time that has been canceled at random times or even random release of tea times in general. So instead of every tea time opening at 6 a.m., maybe a batch opens at 6 and a batch opens at 6. I, I, th these are just different ideas that are coming to light. Now, I don't know how that will work for those companies that, um, you know, are scraping and, and making, you know, the, the customer uh, aware of uh, tea times that become available. I, I know that, um, you know, at the very least, uh, the idea of a canceled tea time getting released at different times, it seems that that would be helpful because... Explain, explain that a little bit. Kevin, because I don't think people realize what's happening at 3.30 in the morning. Explain that a little bit. Yeah, exactly. So I think when, you know, the, the, for example, you know, the, the system here, if it's LA City, what, what you're seeing is that there's some turnover. And, and, and so you have some, uh, the, the tea times all go very quickly. And then prior to that 24-hour cancellation window, a lot of tea times are, are canceled. And I don't know exactly what the percentage is off the top of my head, but you know, I've, I've heard, you know, well beyond 20%. So there's some churn there. Now, um, some of it is, is, is not, you know, brokering, but w what they're also seeing is that the tea times get booked. And then in the middle of the night, a tea time gets canceled and rebooked very quickly because in the LA city system, you actually have to show your ID when you get to the golf course. So if you, if you were a golfer who had paid a concierge service, when you get to the golf course, that tee time needs to have your name on it and you need your player card. Um, so how is this happening? I mean, th these are the kinds of questions that, you know, been sort of looking into for, for quite some time. And I think, um, you know, bots and, uh, you know, something technological, that's one component. But there's also this, there's so much money to be had. And based on what we've seen the last few weeks, how much above the, the greens fee um, some of these tea time times are available for through, you know, uh, you know, what was posted a couple of weeks ago and what went viral that, you know, there, there's real money to be had there. So just the sort of how much of it is sort of brute human force of somebody having multiple devices and booking a lot of times. And then uh, essentially the golfer, you know, has an interest in say the 10, 10 time. And then at 3 a.m. You, you cancel the time. At 3 a.m., you rebook the time with that golfer's name. So when the golfer gets to the golf course, everything looks. Uh, everything looks, looks so It was the golfer that booked it. So that's right. It looks so perfect. And would be extremely difficult to, you know, to to figure out what what can you do with that. If we if if there are four of us and we're all hoping to play on Saturday, and we all get on the the tee sheet at 6 a.m. and we all book a tee time, and then we say, well, which one do we want to take? Well, that there's no brokering. There isn't a, 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 no one is selling that reservation, but the four of us are hoping to play together. We're going to have one booked and three cancellations. So that is problematic too, because it just actually leads to more requests for tea times. That's it, right. It, 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 it's more traffic on the site. It's more churn. We, and, you know, it, we, it's heartbreaking when you hear that a tea time, you, you, you get short, you, 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 a foursome booked and two show up. Because right. 
that means there are golfers like like me, perhaps sitting at home on a Saturday morning, um, and and there was a spot for me. So yeah, um, yeah, we had that, a, we that's had not great for the facility or the golfer. We had another company on earlier, and they they build booking engines for golf courses, and they have a feature that they've named uh, Fair Play Guardian, and it really is built to address exactly what you just said, where people are booking three tee times and only using one of them and whatnot. And so they've actually deployed artificial intelligence to start to identify when a booking looks unusual to the, to the, the mass of bookings that they typically see. And then alerts start to go off and notify different stakeholders at the golf course that, Hey, we think this looks fraudulent. Not that we're going to prevent the person from booking it. Cause maybe it isn't, but you should really look at this one. Here's this particular booking that our uh, fraud technology, you know, sp uh, rates as a very high likelihood of fraud. So, there, yeah, there's people out there building solutions for sure. Um, well, listen, it's been it's been great to have you on. We're, I'm super interested to know you've got, I think you've got two meetings coming up in the very, very near future. First, the advisory board that you chair will meet. And then from a meeting like that, a recommendation will go to the, what, what is the next board called? I'm not sure the. So yes, yeah, so the policy making body is the the board of commissioners. Those board of commissioners. five members are appointees of the mayor. So it's really within the executive branch of government. If if staff wants to make some kind of change, they need board approval. So the department provides reports to the board, and then the the board will will sanction those changes. Um, we're we're really part of that stakeholder process, and um, so. Essentially, this is how it would typically work. We have a meeting on Monday. We will uh, we'll get the opportunity to hear what the recommendations might be and then possibly endorse what staff presents. And then when staff goes to the policymaking, the board, that body, um, then we will have vetted it to some degree. And then the staff will be able to suggest that they went to the golf advisory committee and golf advisory committee provided feedback. It could be that the golf advisory committee endorses the board report, so on and so forth. Well, that's excellent. That's excellent. I, I can't thank you enough for coming on on short notice. I think it's really cool that you guys make yourselves available uh, to, to help people understand this better. Um, like I said in the beginning, I, I'm not so sure that this is an indictment of the technology provider. This is just an odd situation. Uh, not a lot of holes of golf and a whole bunch of golfers. And, and so some oddities will arise. Well, and to your point earlier, I, I certainly hope that one, we can help mitigate some of the, the problems that, that have come from um, this incredible interest in participation, but also I hope that we can uh, sort of parlay this into explaining that, yes, these golf courses are heavily utilized and we need them. And, yes. and it's, it's always going to be important for golfers to show up and make sure that those who have the opportunity to, to make policy decisions, they know that the community cares about these facilities and, and wants to see them continue to do well and provide the game of golf. That's yeah. So well said. So well said. Well, thanks again for your time. Uh, and we'll look forward to speaking to you next week. I'm, I'm very interested to, to see what comes of everything. So thanks again, Kevin. Thank you for having me.